<laughs> Coming to you live from the spectacular Talbot Lecture Hall at the University of Southern Maine, we have for you tonight the most fiendish devil's plot of stories your ears will ever have the horror of hearing. Final Rune Productions presents a benefit for WMPG, Greater Portland, Maine's Community Radio, and for tonight, your home for horror. Starring John Hickson, Tom Power, Christine Marshall, Bert Brimmer, Philip Hobby, and Janice Gardner, with music by Barb Truex and sound effects by Paul Drynand, Michael Townsend, and Michael Goober Manning. Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are, ready to horrify you and the live audience before us. <laughs> so let's begin. Our first tale of woe this evening comes to us from musty old Ireland, where a man from Ohio by the name of Roger Gregg is producing stories to thrill, delight, and curdle your blood for more than 20 years with his crazy dog audio theater. This little tale was originally told on RTE in Ireland, which, I believe, means really terrifying evil. It has been moved to Maine, where just like in Ireland, you'll find old mansions that have a ghost behind the black door. Way down east in Maine, past Ellsworth and Millbridge, and even Whiting, you keep on going till you can't get no more, and there sits a crumbling old sea captain's house perched out on the edge of the world, looking over coal black rocks and the thrashing Atlantic out to Grand Manan Island and the ocean beyond. Now and again, some poor soul who doesn't know any better decides to stay there. The house is haunted, full of angry ghosts all roaring at each other, shouting and crying and carrying on. Why no? Because it's my poor lot to take care of the place. Well, just last week, there was these two people from away. It was still daylight when we arrived at the front door. Oh, my God, this is just so perfect, isn't it, Herbert? Oh, oh y yes, dear, yeah, perfect, yes, great. Oh, this secluded country house is gorgeous. It's so beautiful, Mr... Uh, uh, Payer, Mrs. Excuse me, you'd like a tip? Uh, no, no, not at all. My name is Payer. Oh, you poor, simple rustic filled with authentic local color, I understand. Huh? Herbert, why haven't you given him his tip? What's uh, wrong with you? Uh, uh, sorry, dear, yeah, but, but my hands... What's uh, wrong so with your hands? Really, Mrs., you, you don't I, have I can't, to. I can't. Why luggage. do you always embarrass me, Herbert? What kind of excuse is that? There's something wrong with my hands. You have no problem using them to scratch yourself. I, I, I'm sorry, dear. I, I'm just carrying these suitcases and you... you l l speak, l Herbert, speak. Assert yourself. L l laptop. Oh, I see. It's all about you and your selfish needs but, again. But you you told, told me to carry the luggage. We... Excuses? What do you think these simple people are going to think of me? <laughs> me? Famous Irish-American author, Colleen O'Neill. No, I, I don't think... I'm so the, sorry. My husband is so inept, Mr... Uh, Payer. And we will, right now, Herbert. Come on, set down the luggage and pay the man. No excuses. He's getting impatient. Hey, hold, hold on there. I'm, I'm yes, not yes, at all dear, getting... Dear. Really, Herbert? Why do you have to make this into an embarrassing scene? I just don't understand. Well, here you go, sir. Uh, right, well, uh, thanks. Uh, let me just get this place open and I'll be along. I hope you know what you're getting yourselves into. This is a fiercely cursed place, as you'll find anywhere, you know. The only thing that lives through the night here are the gulls nesting above in the loft. Yes, it is just like a picture postcard, isn't it, Herbert? Uh, um, yes, yes, the uh, po postcard, yeah. Oh, this is the perfect location for writing my new novel. It shall be a mm, moody, moody romance. romance. I can see it already. My story will be set right here, a, a, a brooding, revolutionary drama of a young girl living with her father, Captain something or other, and her stepmother, a, a scheming, jealous woman. Oh, but the daughter, my, my heroine, she's young and beautiful with long, flowing, flowing red, red hair. hair. She's coming of age, but is cruelly cut off from the world by her stepmother who has evil designs on her. Then one day, she meets a handsome young Indian with... 
flashing blue eyes, strong, rough hands, and well rounded, rounded buttocks. buttocks. Hey, uh, 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 yes, well, that's a grand story, but when you're ready, I'll open the door here, Mrs. Oh, I can't wait to see the inside. <laughs> Oh, my God. It's fantastic, isn't it? Look at that huge, sweeping staircase. Well, in my time alone, 13 souls have tumbled to their death down those stairs. Five from Boston, six from New York, and two from Georgia. <laughs> Pushed by an unseen, ghostly hand after opening the black door above. All of them landing right where you're standing now, Mrs. <laughs> each with a twisted smile fixed on their face, smiling like a beached whale. Oh, that's a great idea. I will stand smiling on this sweeping staircase for my photograph for the back of the book. Uh, just off to the side there is a big double doors to the grand ballroom, but you don't ever want to go in there. Oh, all right, let's go in. I'll open these doors. No, Mrs., no. I, I can't bear to even look in there. Oh, gasp. Oh, my God. It's, it's a grand ballroom. This is the perfect place to set up my designated work area. You hear, Herbert? Uh, yeah, work area. Oh, look at those huge windows and the view. I can see the cliffs and the sea. Oh, what atmosphere. It's perfect. There must be so much history in these walls. Oh, you're right about that, missus. Some say it was here that the bodies of the dancers were found. The story is that at the Grand Ball of 1967, two lovers went off to be alone in the room above with the black door. Next morning, they had danced themselves to death, and there was a twist record still playing over and over. Others say the ballroom was built over an ancient Indian burial ground, which was excavated by the settlers and dumped into the ocean. Oh, yes. I shall work here day long with no interruptions, Herbert. Uh, no, 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 no interruptions, Colleen. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's so atmospheric, I can... I swear I can even hear music. Yes. Yes, I hear music. Can you hear it? Mm, no. No, no, no. Herbert, don't say you can't hear that. Hear what? Oh, don't start with me, Herbert. Uh, if you'll follow me in now, please, I, I can show you the other rooms. This way. Up the stairs. Come along, Herbert. We don't have all day. Yeah. All right, here you are. Um... This is the master bedroom here. Now, what's that strange door down here? <gasps> that door there? Yes, that lone door at the end of the hallway. The one that's painted black. The black door? Yes, a black door. Uh, black door. Now listen here and listen close. If the two of you want to stay alive, don't you ever, ever open that door. Yes. What a brilliant idea. Let's see what's in that room. Oh, I just love a mystery. Oh, may Jesus save us. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, dear, for thou dear, art I, with I, me. I, I don't think Mr. Payer, I don't think he wants us to go in there. Nonsense, Herbert. Well, he looks oh. quite concerned. No, these country folk do the most deliberately superstitious things to amuse tourists, that's all. No, but, but, but Colleen, I... I, I, I I'm the famous writer, remember? Give me a little credit. Yeah, but, but Colleen, he's praying on his knees. Oh, Look at Herbert, him. Oh, Herbert, you can't possibly understand these people the way I do. My job is to know the inner workings of even the most backwater country now, what yeah, is but, wrong with this yeah, but, stupid black no, no, door? No, no. I, I don't. Oh, oh, good God. No. Golly, please don't. No, don't. It's locked. Oh, how very strange. Oh, well. <sighs> oh, oh, my hat. That was worth a turtle in the fishing boat in the winter of 72. <laughs> Thank God. Well, if you're all settled, I'll be on my way. I've got errands to do, and it's uh, getting dark soon. I'll be looking in on you tomorrow morning. Uh, just don't open that black door. Remember, the black door. Yeah, the black door, right, okay. Good luck. Herbert. What? Why were you so rude to him? W what? You're so inconsiderate. No, no, I wasn't. Oh, I, come I, on, I, don't just stand there, put everything in its place, and set up my designated work area. Uh, yes, Colleen, yeah. So straight away that very morning, Colleen O'Neill was hard at work typing away at her computer in the ballroom, uh, uh, her designated work area. The man on horseback approached, and she heard his menacing voice. Good day to you, roared Mr. Guiley. She quickly turned and dashed away, spurning the proud farmer and his arrogant manner. 
She could not be tamed, not even by the richest man in the county. Something strangely called to her as she dove into the deep, long river, her clothing being torn off by the rushing water. The yearning desires of her young heart were now as tangled as her long red hair as she fought back against the powerful current, listening to the wild sounds of the savages in the woods. And that's when she saw him. Colleen. Colleen. Tall, native, handsome and strong, his massive tomahawk swinging to and fro as he tiptoed through the wet grass, his his leather tunic was open, revealing his manly chest, and then her eyes met his. Herbert, for the last time, stop walking, I'm trying to work. Hello. Oh, oh, he startled me. I'm sorry, it's only me. <laughs> I, di- I didn't see you come in, I'm sorry. <laughs> but haven't we met before? Oh no. No, you wouldn't know the likes of me, but I know you. (laughs) Well, yes, of course, a lot of people do. I'm recognized everywhere. I'm Colleen O'Neill, the author. Suppose you want an autograph? (laughs) Oh, no. I was just out in the field and saw you sitting here through the window. Oh, I see you work here. I do. I couldn't help seeing that you seem troubled. I do? Oh, yes. Yes. Your man above is troubling you, isn't he? What? Oh, you mean Herbert? I wouldn't let it get away with that. A fine, fine woman like yourself deserves better. Yes, I suppose. I'm sorry. It's not my place to be giving out advice. I'm just a fine cut of a lumberjack. With a manly chest. What? Never mind, but you're, you're, you're right. Herbert does get in the way sometimes. So, he is in the way, is he? He enjoys interfering with my work. You know, I have an axe out back in the shed. It's old, but the ash is strong. The end of it would cut through whatever's troubling you, you know. What? No, no, I'm here to work on this book. I've just started. Here, let me show you the opening. The first sentence is so important. Here, what do you think of this? But, hey, where are you? Uh, He's gone. As Colleen O'Neill sat typing away in the ballroom, poor Herbert spent the entire day upstairs unpacking everything as quiet as a church mouse, moving as slow as a dry slug in the hot sun. That is, until he heard something from down the hall. Hello? Is somebody there? Colleen? No, no, no. It's it's just the wind. (laughs) This place is full of drafts. I gotta go unpack that last suitcase. Uh, Uh, Herbert? Yes, dear? My work area. Sorry, sorry, dear. It's almost, almost done. Well, packing. hurry up already. What's taking you so long? Sorry. I, I, how the hell can I go fast and not make a song? A crazy woman. I heard that, Herbert. What? what? I said I heard I, that. I didn't say anything. Just, Don't start with me, Herbert. No, it must be the wind. You know? Don't yes. even try it, Herbert. There is no wind. It's perfectly calm. What? I said it's perfectly calm. Calm. D- what? I guess, Everything uh, is calm! Yeah, yeah, any, anything you say, dear. Oh, this place is damp, too. What's wrong with Florida, I said. No, 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 we gotta go down east. How, can, how do you go this far north and still be down? You know, all she can do is write another crappy bestseller. Oh, jeez. Oh, help me. Please, help me. H- hello? Oh! You can hear me. Y- yeah, I-, I can hear you. W- where are you? I'm down here, locked in this room. Y- you're in a room? Y- the room with the black door? Yes. Please, please help me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I- I- I'll-, I'll see if I can get you out. Oh, thank you. 
Please hurry. It's no use. It's locked. You must get the key. Who, who are you? Why, why are you locked in there? I can't explain. Not now. I've been waiting so long. <laughs> look, look, don't cry. Look, I, I'm here to help, and I, I'll help you. Look, I... Oh, your voice sounds so very kind. Mm-hmm. I hear something so wonderful, so sensual in your manly voice. Oh, oh yeah? Well, thank you. Did anyone ever tell you that? It, well, you know, it's funny. I, people used to say that to me all the time. What is your name? Her, 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 Herbert. Herbert. That's a lovely name. <laughs> Who are you, Herbert? I, I, I used to be a big TV talk, talk show host, but then I met Colleen. <laughs> you poor, poor man. That's, it's not so bad. Oh, no. just listen to yourself. What? That's not the real you. How, how do you know? <laughs> I can hear something buried. Can, can you? Yes. Something denied inside you for a long time. Something wonderful. Am I right, Herbert? Yeah, yeah. So, sometimes I remember how I used to be. Of course. Each night I'd come out on stage uh, on my TV show and, and say, H- Hello, I'm Herbert Hartford, your award winning host of Point Blank. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, tonight, tonight, hey, we're coming to you live from Carnegie Hall. Hey, joining me tonight is Bill Gates, Hillary Clinton, Steven Spielberg, Mary Robinson, and the little guy with glasses who used to play Radar from MASH. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then I'd go and, no, I'd do a monologue about politicians or sex or sex with politicians, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I'd even improvise. God, I forgot about the cue cards, and I'd just improvise. Imagine me just, just improvising. It sounds wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was. It was just it's how I'm not, I, it's how it used to be. I'm, I'm not that guy anymore. Oh, why do you deny it, Herbert? <laughs> because. It's <laughs> that woman downstairs, isn't it? Well, you know, Colleen says I've got to focus on working to build a supportive relationship. No. No? That's not where you'll find happiness. Your true bliss lies elsewhere. Where? Open this door. I can't. It's, it's locked. Then find the key. It's hidden in the house. Herbert? Uh, Look for the key. D- Herbert, have you gone insane? D- d- I'll find the key, and, and you and I can... Shh, don't say it. Your wife is coming. Don't tell her I'm here. No, no, no. Herbert? <laughs> Who are you talking to? D- d- no one. <laughs> you've been talking with yourself. God knows what else you've been doing up here. Uh, what? Your personal habits don't concern me. Look, you you asked me to unpack, and that's what I've been doing. Don't take that tone with me. What do you think you are? Uh, 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 Herbert Hartford? (laughs) Well, you listen to me, Herbert Hartford. I've been hearing a lot of voices. Voices? Local people. Which local people? Never you mind. He saw. Who saw what? He saw right away what was going on here. Nothing's going on. I've been unpacking. I mean how you bully me like this. In this relationship. I, I bully you? As if you didn't know. All right, play your little game, but don't think people don't see. He certainly does. Who? Who who are you talking about? Never mind who. He's special, not like you. He appreciates me. He sees I'm suffocating in this relationship. You're suffocating? Yes. All day long, you've done nothing but sulk about slamming doors and stomping around, (laughs) banging things, moving furniture, invading my designated work area and my mind space just to prevent the blossoming of my feminine creative energies. No, I haven't. You wanted me to... I'm not going to let you dominate this conversation anymore. I am going back downstairs to work, and if you care about our supportive relationship, you will not make a sound. Yes, dear. Silence. I need absolute silence. (laughs) Oh, Herbert. I hear you suffering so much. Please, find the key so that we can be together, you and I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll find the key. I'll I'll find it if I have to tear this place apart. I mean... Night had fallen, and Colleen continued working on the book as Herbert set about turning the place upside down, looking for the key to open the black door. He was making a fierce racket. was a forbidden love. Her stepmother, so jealous of her beauty, had locked her in the upper room, 
A room with only one window, perched over the jagged cliff, overlooking the angry sea. Damn, where is it? Oh, they were trying to drive her mad, to make her go crazy, but she would not be suffocated. Be here somewhere. Oh yes, they would try their best to prevent her, to come between her and her heart's desire, but she would make them shut up! <laughs> Herbert, why are you doing this to me? Colleen. Oh, it's you. Yes. Um, sorry. Oh, no. I was hoping you would come. I know it's not my place to say anything. Oh, do. Say it. I've been thinking about you all day. You have? Yes. Where the hell is it? Where's, I gotta find that key. Listen God. to him. He's driving me crazy. Key. I don't mean anything by it, but a beautiful woman like you shouldn't have to take his carrying on. You're right. You deserve better. Someone who can support you proper. Yes. Someone who took one look at you and fell in love. Oh, yes. 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 Maybe, if you got that old axe out of the shed. Yes. Yes, you're right. I'll get it. I'll get it right now. You do that. I'll be waiting here for you, Colleen. I've searched every room in the house except... Except the ballroom. Yeah, the ballroom. Her designated work area. We'll just see about that. <laughs> Oh, the door's wide open and she's not here. <laughs> good, good. Listen to me, I'm, I'm improvising, <laughs> speaking freely for the first time in years. Oh, Herbert, come to me. Oh, I'm coming as soon as I find the... the wait, the black cabinet. Yeah, that's where it must be. Ha, <laughs> ha, I have it, the key, I found the key. Herbert, hurry. No, I'm coming, I'm coming, my darling. You have the ax? Yes. You must find him and set him straight. Yes. I'll set him straight. Very straight. <laughs> oh, Herbert, have you the key? Oh, yes, yes, my dear, I have the key. <gasps> Herbert, <laughs> it's unlocked. You've done it. Yes, and now I'm opening the black door. Come to me. Oh, Herbert, is that really you? Yes. It's the real me. Oh, you're so handsome. And, and you. You're so beautiful. Oh. 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 Herbert, improvise. Improvise for me, Herbert. What? Here? Now? Yes. <laughs> Let your mind wander as freely as your hands. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, hello, I'm Herbert Hartford, your host of Point Blank. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to say I, I've i never... Oh, say it. I've, say it. I've, I've, I've never felt so... so alive. Oh, Herbert! Oh. Oh. Mm. Herbert! Oh, oh, God, it's Colleen. Stay with me. Don't let her take you from me. No, no, I won't, I won't. Hey, well, close the door. Herbert. Herbert. I know you're in there. Go away. Leave me alone. Oh, I wish I could, Herbert. Let me in, Herbert. <laughs> no. What did you say? Yeah, you heard me. You open that black door, Herbert. I need to work on our relationship. <laughs> what relationship? All right, Herbert. You leave me no choice. How's that, Herbert? A taste of your own medicine. Your constant selfish noise pounding into my head. You don't frighten me, Colleen. Not anymore. You'll stand up for yourself when I tell you to stand up for yourself. And not before. Oh, yeah? That does it. No, yeah. what are you doing? I'm going out there and settle this once and for all. No, you must stay nah, here. Now, don't worry here, dearest. I'll be back. Colleen! I'm coming out. You hear me? Colleen? Colleen? Colleen, where are you? Here, 
you were. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Hey, get off me, you. Oh, no, Harbert, no. she's trying to kill you. Get rid of him, Colleen. No, I love you. Robert. I love you, Colleen. No, no, I, love I love you. Hey, who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? Colleen, watch out the staircase. Oh, we're going to fall. Oh! And in the morning, that's how I found the pair of them. Laying entangled together at the bottom of the stairs. Just like all the others, a strange smile on their faces. I put the axe back in the shed and hid the key at the black door. And on a dark night, they say you can hear the voices of them New Yorkers roaring at each other along with all the other that's gone before. You told me to unpack. Don't take that tone with me. Who do you think you are? I'm Herbert Hartford. Well, you listen to me, Herbert Hartford. Why do you believe me? I pull you. Ah, well, well. Those two people from away really found what they were looking for, didn't they? And by the end of it, they were falling all over each other again. <laughs> Our next part of the evening is dedicated to shorter tales of horror. Stories where the happenings are so ghoulish that no one lives more than 15 minutes. The first trouble tale comes from a very local writer, though the setting is far, far away. Writer Fred Greenalge still dreams of New Orleans, where in a dimly lit bar a stranger recounts his story and remembers that losing you is hell. Aren't you cute, huddled in a dark corner behind a bottle of Jim Beam? Huh? Oh, you again. You act like you've met me. Feels like I have. Well, then you won't mind if I take a seat. What are we gonna hear tonight? Huh? You're the musician, right? You didn't just come to this hole to get plastered. Yeah, that's right. I haven't decided yet. You gonna let Jim Beam take the wheel? Maybe. Give me a slug of that. Give me one of your smokes. Deal. You play in town often? <laughs> More than I'd like. Oh, well, I'm local. The name's... Don't. What? It's easier that way. Oh. Seriously, though, what's got you down? What makes you think I'm not just a drunk? <laughs> Didn't say you weren't, but I can tell a sad drunk from a happy one. There's a cloud behind your eyes. I'd rather not talk about it. Oh, sure, I get it. You're the one blues man who won't tell his story to a stranger. You wouldn't want to hear it. What makes you so sure? You know, you're a stubborn one. <laughs> you can tell that so soon. Feels like I've known you for a very long time. Isn't that funny how life feels like that sometimes? <laughs> if you want to call this a life. If it isn't, where are we, hon? Give me another smoke. It all starts and ends here in New Orleans. City of dreams, nightmares. I was in town for a gig. And after the gig, I found myself sticking around in the bar. Naturally. Speaking to a woman, not so unlike yourself, shockingly beautiful. Yes. In a dark way, golf, you know, with attitude. Where is this going? Back to her apartment. Mm, I like the sound of that. Uh, but it was more than that. So much more. As soon as we spent a minute with one another, we knew we wanted to spend every moment together for that moment forward. The night was magic. The following day, we went out for breakfast, walked along the river, laughed about life. We spoke the language of one another's souls. So you're a romantic. I can be too sometimes. Couldn't stay forever. Had three more shows, Lafayette, Dallas, Austin, and I left her with a promise that I'd be back. <laughs> of course you left. Did you come back? Yes. But things had changed. She lived in an attic apartment of a crumbling 19th century duplex. You had to 
pass through an iron gate to a vast courtyard and take a set of rickety stairs that used to be a fire escape and then down a long hallway, up another set of stairs, and then... Then? Then I found her. The apartment was empty, or so it looked. But you said... Yes. She wasn't in the living room, or in the office, or the kitchen. But then I opened the door to her bedroom. No. There she was. She was stretched out on a bed, a bottle of red wine half finished and the rest pooling around her chest on a nightstand an empty pill bottle in her hand yes my obituary yo yes but I, I don't know well I, I do now I didn't then I was killed in a car crash thrown into the swamp good god tell me about it so that's it Hardly. What? You wonder what drives a man to drink, huh? What gets me trying to bury what little bit of emotion might be left in me at the bottom of a bottle? I'll tell you. Oh, yes. Every drunk's got a story. But my story leads straight to hell. Let's get going, then. Next to the bottle of pills was a book of matches. Madame Genevieve, an address in the Ninth Ward. Audiences with the dead. I call the number. Yes? I have a problem. A loved one. She was. Mm, come at once. Couldn't get a taxi quickly enough. Now I'll skip the boring bits. She was a hoodoo woman of no trifling power, lean and black with fire in her eyes. We sat down to pull tarot cards and parlay with the dead. And? She told me I had to go to the underworld. She told you? Yes. The only way I could bring my love back was to go to hell and get her myself. It was harder and darker than I could ever imagine. Like being sucked into the mouth of a dragon. It was difficult to orient. Every sense was different. The ground was wrong. And I felt my soul chipping away every second I was there. But you endured. Oh, did I? I stamped forward across the frying plains, through the howls of the damned, and down a long staircase of bones, deeper into the bowels of that terrible place. Every lost soul I encountered, I asked, Where do I find the lord of this place? Where do I find the lord of this place? Where do I find the lord of this place? Go! Damn it, I won't! Down, then. But you may never return. She pointed to a darkness even darker than the rest of the place. A hole sucking what little light there was into it. And I headed towards it. Weren't you scared? <laughs> scared? Yeah. But desperate. And unarmed. No. <laughs> I had my guitar. And as I approached the hole, the fear finally hit me. I froze dumbly, staring into the void as you might stand before a sheer cliff before jumping. I know this was a one-way trip. However, I came out on the other end. I knew I'd never be the same. Yet I stepped in. Now imagine you were standing on the outside on a bright July day, staring at the sun, just staring, forcing yourself to keep looking even when you wanted to look away. You do that for a good half an hour more until your eyes tear up from the brightness. Now imagine you were instantly transported to the bowels of a coal mine half a mile under the earth. Standing there in the dark, your eyes would weep in shock. They would take 10, 20 minutes to adjust, hours maybe. You might even go blind. You get me? Yes. Now imagine, when all that clears up, all the darkness begins to dissipate like silt settling on the bottom of a pond. Imagine now that in that coal mine at the bottom of the earth, far from where you are comfortable or have power to do anything about your fate, 
sitting there in the still darkness, implacable as a coiled viper, is the devil. The devil? None other. Well, how did you know? You know. You know. So? So what? You want to know what I did then? When I'd lost my love, descended into the depths of hell, and stood before the king of darkness with my damn guitar to protect me? <laughs> you want to know what happens next? <laughs> I asked him to let us be together again. You didn't. You bet I did. And he... Agreed. He did? There was a catch. What? I would have to live it all over again. What? I would get a second chance knowing full well what evil would happen. But, no. Aren't you supposed to sing him a song, change his mind, make him believe in love? That's not how it works. So you're telling me that, providing I believe your crazy story, after all of this, you didn't bring her back? You see... That's what it all comes down to, how you phrase a question, what you ask for, and ask for the wrong thing. What? I asked for us to be together again, not for anything to change. But wouldn't something have to be different? No. No, <clears throat> nothing had to change at all. But you saw your, well, you know, and certainly that was a... No mistake. No mistake at all. What? was it then? You see, sometimes when someone clings too strongly to a dream, to a love, to another, they stick around. 3,000 pounds of crushed steel and glass can't take that away. You're a ghost. <laughs> no, that, don't worry. I'm not there yet. Not yet. Flesh and blood. Here, feel my hand. Flesh and blood. Yes. You're warm. Yet, here I am, back in New Orleans, in a dark bar, drinking bourbon, except... Except? Except I haven't gone on stage yet. I haven't sung that song that hits her in the soul, that gets my bleary eyes to meet her dark green ones in the dark. I haven't lit the spark that starts the magic, the brilliantly glorious magic spell that leads to... Falling in love with her again. And killing her again. You go on stage in five minutes, cowboy. It wasn't supposed to happen like this. But it did. You get a second chance and you can't even stop it? What makes you think it's just a second chance? Well, you knew I'd fall in love with you the moment I laid eyes on you. Listen, you have to forget this ever happened. Now, I'm just some lonely drunk in a bar. This was some idiotic story. Just forget it and go out and, and live your life. But, but isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it right now? Your, your hand, it's still warm. We still have tonight, don't we? And, and maybe, just maybe it won't happen again. It'll happen. Oh, yes, it will happen. To me. But it doesn't have to happen to you. Do you understand? That's the only thing I accomplished. The only thing that's made it worth everything I have had to go through. Damn it! I, I wish there was some drink that would make you forget me once and for all. I won't. For heaven's sake, I won't. You'll stick around, right? You'll stay with me? Even if it's just one night, just one kiss. The good is better than the evil, right? You promise me one thing, okay? Anything. Tomorrow morning, we sleep in. <laughs> I'm getting sick of beignets. We can get delivery from mothers. You're a star, love. I'll see you at the end of the set. You do know what it means to miss New Orleans, don't you? You can take a drink and drink and drive, but don't expect to get home anytime soon. 
Our next short tale is from Mark Laflamme, a writer from L.A., Lewiston, Auburn, that is. And the location of this tale of terror is much closer to home, in a beautiful lake where you've no doubt gone swimming or fishing. Oh, but something dark lies just beneath the surface. And as we'll find out, not all is well in the water of Bone Lake. Well, me and Rupert were still in the ice shack at sundown, halfway through the third bottle of Jack and cozied up by the wood stove that kept the shack as hot as balls. <laughs> we were arguing again about the topic that heated us up more than any other. Rupert, how many times I got to tell you there aren't any muskies in Bone Lake? Maybe way up north, but not down here. Bull. I told you, this, this guy from Massachusetts hauled three of them in out of here last summer. I, I, I hear one of the suckers weighed over 10 pounds. This the same guy went deer hunting and bagged a goat and then brought it in to get it tagged? I have it on very good authority that that never happened. Byrne told me oh, that... Oh, Byrne's drunker most days than you and I are right now. Uh, now, if you believe what he has to say... Oh, um, it's Joseph. Of course it's Joseph. What, 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 do you, what do you think he wants? Same thing he always does. Uh, <clears throat> oh, well, hi, Joseph. <laughs> Cold in the witch's tit out there, ain't it, huh? Big swig of Jack for you, warm you right up. Have you seen them today? Any sign of them at all? Uh, no, Joseph, nothing at all today. Just a couple of pickerel, and they weren't worth keeping. Uh, it looks like your line has some tension on it. Pull it in, please. Rupert. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah sure. See, Joseph, just a, just a dead shiner, have, have, haven't had a bite. Been like that all day. We haven't seen them, really, really. Oh, all right. Call me if you see them. I won't be far. I wish Joseph were asking about the muskies when he came to the shack, but he wasn't. He was asking about his wife and daughter who drowned two years back on Bone Lake. You see... I've lived in this town my whole life, and I've known Joseph for a lot of years, as much as a man can get to know a guy like Joseph. He's always been quiet, but likable. The kind who works from dusk till dawn, even if the men on his crew complained. <laughs> the kind of guys you'd rather duck out at 5 p.m. to chase broads around at Rumor's Bar. Joseph would kill himself to get nice things for his family, and man, was he protective of them. If a stranger stopped to say hello and admire his little girl, Joseph was gracious enough. But he also watched that stranger like an alligator watching over its young. You got the sense that Joseph was a cocked rifle ready to remove the head of anybody fool enough to make a threatening gesture or pass an unwelcome remark. That he survived their deaths at all is a little bit of a shocker because for a time he seemed destined for the end of a rope or the barrel of a gun jammed into his yappa. The best anybody can guess, Julie and Hannah got stuck out on Bone Lake in their canoe when the storm snuck in from the east. That was July, two years ago, a summer where the storms came out of nowhere and hit like a bomb. They were out in the worst of them, too, up in Rangeley, a tornado developed and tore the roof off a mile's worth of camps. <laughs> out of state as camps, true, but a hell of a lot of damage nonetheless. Joseph was at the work site that day, and the way I hear it, he, he had no idea his wife and daughter was headed out with the canoe. It was Tony DeJardin who had to go over to the job site over in Weld and tell Joseph that his wife and kid was missing. Uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph, can I, can I grab you for a minute? What? Uh, you, you might want to sit down, Joseph. What the hell is it, Tony? Uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, but I have to inform you that, that there's been an accident. What kind of accident? Your, your canoe. It, it was found washed up at the camp of Ernest Sinclair. All that we found was a waterproof pouch and Julie's 
wallet was in it. What does that mean? Some of her stuff got lost? We've already been to your house, and there's no sign of them. Julie's Jeep was found parked in the boat landing for Bone Lake. No, no, that can't be true. Julie and Hannah were going to stay home today, bake a pie. I'm sorry, Joseph. They're, they're missing. Damn it, you lie. Hey, 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 Joseph. Now hold on. Get, get a hold of yourself. P pull yourself together. You lie, you lie. Their bodies were never found, and sometimes I wonder if that makes all the difference. Would Big Joseph have mourned and moved on if he'd had the corpses to lay to rest and grieve for? Joseph dropped out of sight for a while, and then in late August of that summer, he began to haunt Bone Lake. I'm not one for dramatics. I normally wouldn't use a word like haunt to describe what a living man does, but Joseph was more like a, an apparition in those days after he lost his mind. Boaters and fishermen told stories about how he would appear out of the fog as they came ashore and how he'd approach them with those eyes as hard and depthless as marble sewn into the heads of stuffed creatures. Have you seen them? Any sign of them? Always the same questions. He would appear on beaches and quiz young lovers as they strolled away from romps on blankets. He'd rise from the rocks beneath Stockley Bridge and scare the crap out of anglers who half dozed with rods in their hands. He stood along shores on all sides of the lake, waiting for the latest kayaker of the day to paddle in. He scared one family from New Jersey so badly they abandoned the camp on the north side of the lake they'd rented just the day before. His hair grew wild. His beard went crazy. He was almost never seen in the grocery store or restaurants, and... Nobody knew what he did when he wasn't haunting Bone Lake. The town selectman fretted about it a little bit because it wasn't good for tourism to have a very large, scary man frightening people away from the camps, but as far as I know, the matter was never taken up in public. So what were we going to do? Tell a six-foot-six, three-hundred-pound grieving man that he couldn't visit the lake in which his wife and kid had disappeared? None of them had the balls to do a thing, and so he kept on haunting Joseph first haunted me and Rupert the winter after his family drowned. and I know he haunted others, too. That first winter, Everett Paulson lost what he says was a 15-pound pike snagged from below the ice. Paulson was fishing in a shack with Greg Whitehouse and a couple of other meatheads when they hooked the pike. Woo! Hey, 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 look at these things. It's oh, monster. Man, it's, 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 it's oh. not good enough for a trophy. Oh, yeah. Hey, oh, hey, oh, hey oh, get oh, off me. Oh, hey, oh, son oh, of a bitch. Oh, that's my fit. Have you seen them? Uh, no, 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 Joseph. Uh, no, no sign of them at all. No, no sign of nothing. Later, the shack had to be hauled back to shore and White House needed a change of underwear. <laughs> the presence of an insane man is unnerving and frightening and just no good for fishing at all. It wasn't that Joseph was more persistent during the ice fishing months. He was only more troublesome because there were fewer of us out there. At the end of the day, we'd meet other fishermen on the shore and we'd sort of mumble about it, but that was about all. We never liked to talk about it much because we never knew where Joseph was or where he might appear. So you'll forgive me if I say he haunted us. And if you'd been there when the big man came and knocking, you'd understand completely. The time Rupert and me finished off three bottles of Jack while arguing about muskies was the last time Joseph came to the door of our shack. He died in March, and he didn't go at the end of a rope, as I once suspected he would, and he didn't go by the way of the gun either. He, he fell through the ice one March, when the only ones dumb enough to be still out there were the Jacob brothers, and even they wouldn't walk across the thin patch at Long Brook. <laughs> maybe he meant to do it, or maybe it was an accident, but... There wasn't a lot said about it. We did all go to a little memorial over at St. David's. A sister nobody knew about came in from California, but she was gone again right after it was over. We all stood around and at last talked openly about the way he had haunted Bone Lake. It was sad. I mean, we all agreed. But it was also damn spooky. I mean, I didn't say it. Nobody else did either. But in a way that is selfish and shameful, we were glad he was gone. 
It was somehow romantic that Big Joseph found his end in the same waters that took his family. So now it's January again. Me and Rupert were out last night dropping our lines and drinking our sour mash and <laughs> arguing about muskies. There are no muskies in Bone Lake. You can take my word for that. I mean, you won't find a friggin' muskie anywhere south of Arusta County, and that's practically Canada. I'm telling you, man, they've been here migrating south from the St. John River, and, and, and they're here chowing on all our trout and salmon. Man, you are so full of it, your eyes are brown. Everyone knows it's too warm to... Rupert, you're lying! Son of a bitch. I bet that goddamn muskie's right there. That's gone slack. Well, you didn't give it enough play, damn you, Rupert. Like hell, son of a bitch snapped my line. But his line hadn't snapped, and we hadn't lost our monster catch. Never had one, as it turns out. A half a minute after the line went limp as a noodle, there was a great disturbance in the water around the little hole. It was not the kind of disturbance you will see when a fish in agony is thrashing. It wasn't a, a natural sort of turmoil, and we knew it was wrong at once. Jesus! What's that? <laughs> Have you seen them? Any sign of them? A frozen hand rose from the hole, and a frozen finger uncurled in my direction. I thought I would faint dead away at the sight and the sounds of dead Joseph searching for his family. But I didn't. Neither did Rupert. We sat where we were and addressed him as though it were any other day with a grieving man knocking at the door of the ice shack. <laughs> Nothing today, Joseph. <laughs> Not even junk fish. Yeah, sorry, Joseph. May maybe try again another day. Oh, thank you. And with that, the big man nodded sadly and descended into the hole till only the icy shags of his hair could be seen beneath the dark water. And then he was gone. On to the next hole to rise up and inquire again. Rupert and I remained still for a full minute. And then we both raced to the overturned bottle of Jack. We were fighting over it when a girlish scream arose from two shacks down and we knew Big Joseph had found Everett Paulson and his dipstick friends. Well, I, I wet my last line in Bone Lake, and it's a sad thing because there's no better way for a lonely man to pass a winter. Rupert's done too, and I suspect there will be fewer shacks out on the lake each time I drive by. Up in Maine, we can tolerate a lot, but no man wants to fish with a dead man mucking up his hole. <laughs> it's frightening and wrong, and it's just not good for fishing at all. Oh, won't you come on in? The water is cold, but don't worry. If you get positively froze up, you can always find another place to chill out. But seriously, there is always something beneath the surface. And in this case, it might just even pull you down. <laughs> now, for our next piece, wait, we have... Wait, hey, hello. Uh, hello. Wait, uh, there's a human. Yes, a human. Hey, uh, I was hoping I could have a short word with you. Uh, excuse me, but who may you be? Well, I'm from the radio station. I'd like to make a pitch. Excuse me, you're a witch. I like the sound of that. Uh, uh, a pitch, a pitch for the station. Oh, now that's disappointing. No, no, actually, it's quite good. This whole evening here is to celebrate, well, radio drama, which wouldn't be possible without community radio, and that's a treat. But what about all of the ghouls? Yes, we have goals. Yes, we're trying to raise $250,000, which is a lot of money, and it's a tough time to be doing it. But we know that we can, and it'll be a powerful thing when we do. We're going to be increasing our transmitter strength so that people from Lewiston to Wells can hear WMPG, and people who already can hear it can hear it better. I'm afraid I don't see what this has to do with vampires, werewolves, pixies, dragons, demons, ghosts, shades, serpents, mummies, or other monsters. 
Well, what we're saying is that r the radio station makes this possible for people to be in this room. <laughs> and for people to tune into this story wherever they are in the world. And in order to expand our mission, we could use the support of people in this room. <laughs> or the people at home or in the car or in the graveyard to do it. Ah, you're angling for donations. Yes, and if you came tonight, thank you. Your ticket price went 100% to WMPG. And if you buy any of the cool t-shirts we have outside, well, that'll go to WMPG too. And you can donate more if you want to. Just ask someone outside at the desk. And if you're home, well, maybe you're in front of a computer and you can go to WMPG.org where you'll see the donate button wmpg.org, and it's a PayPal button, fast, easy, secure, and most importantly, it helps the radio station and helps keep great audio horror like what you're hearing tonight. That's ghoul -tacular. And can we get on to the next hor horrible tale of terror yet? I understand the next one has ghouls. Well, not just yet. I understand there is to be an intermission. Okay, everyone, you've got 10 minutes to stand up, take a stretch, and check out our swag, and we'll be right up after that. I see. I'm being cut to music. Okay, okay. You're all back in the house getting comfortable into your chairs. Well, except for you back there. Yes, you. Would you hurry up to your seat, please? You're holding up the works. Oh, dear. Well, our next tale of terror involves the undead, the rottingly wonderful kin and so close to my heart, black and maggot-ridden as it is. By Kevin Anderson from... Idyllic California comes a tale of horror. Oh, and <laughs> it says right here that it is Mr. Anderson's 10th anniversary today. How ghoulishly romantic. I do hope you were married under the light of a blood red moon, Mr. Anderson. Could we, oh dear audience, have a quick word? Happy anniversary, Kevin Hope. Well. That was as dreadful as a rotten corpse that's been left in the cellar for two months. Now let's try it again. Happy anniversary, Kevin and Ho! Much better. And now for our story of a company that will rent you cut-rate workers. Uh, just don't, don't go out in the field to visit them. This one is called Third Shift. Would you get that, Helen? Your hand's broken. But, the phone is right in front of you. Must we have this conversation every time the phone rings? Am I the boss or am I the boss? Yes, Mr. Boss Man. My feet are like wings, Mr. Boss Man. A little less sarcasm, a little more phone answering, please. Thank you for calling, T.M. Hey, listen, listen, Labor. Listen, How may there. I... Listen, I want to talk to someone down there. Uh-huh. There's, no, there's problems everywhere. Oh, well, 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 that's What kind of business are you running? Uh -huh. Listen, I want to talk to someone. Uh, can uh, you I'm hold on uh, one uh, minute, sir? Uh, uh, hey, Mr. Bossman. I rate customer on line one. We only have one line, Helen. You got to think positive, sweetie. One day we could have ten lines. Jeez, I'm never going to finish these quarterlies. How I rate on a scale from one to ten? About a twelve. That's just great. Okay, put her on the speaker, then go get me a scotch heavy on the ice. When exactly did I become the company barmaid? About the same time I was dumb enough to hire a cocktail waitress as my assistant. The tips were better. You ready? <clears throat> yeah. This is Alan Carver, third shift manager. Yeah, Mr. Carver, what the hell kind of service are you running at? I I'm not f sure what you're referring to, sir. I Your laborers should have started work hours ago. Uh, let's back up a bit. Uh, t tell me who you are. 
Oh, great. Yeah, sure, I gotta go over everything again. Didn't that idiot who answered the phone sell you anything of this? We're not, we're not gonna accomplish anything with, with insults, sir. Please, just, just tell me who you are and, and give me your account number if you have it. My name is David McFarland. I don't have my account number on me, and I own the McFarland Winery in Napa Valley. And how long have you been a client of TM, Mr. McFarland? The, the third week. I already explained all this. Thank you. Uh, can, can you hold on one minute? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Urgent, Helen, I need a customer file on McFarland Winery in Napa Valley. I was just about to go on break. Helen, what do I pay you for? The worst coffee you've ever tasted, frighteningly good looks, and mind-bending conversation. Oh, for the love of... All right, all right, I'll look for it. Mr. Carver, if one more person puts me on hold, I'm uh, gonna... I'm, I'm just looking for your file. Now, what, what can I help you with this evening? Is, is there something wrong with your service? No, the service so far has been excellent. Then what seems to be the problem? There's no one in my field! Look, I can, I can see the field. Your organization is supposed to work tonight from my bedroom window. I couldn't sleep, so I thought I'd go look on the laborers you're supposed to have in my field starting at 10 p.m. It's almost been now. Where are they? Okay, this is a common misunderstanding with our service. Our laborers do eight hours worth of work in less than four hours. We meet the negotiated shift quota in half the time, so our workers don't even show up until midnight, and, and they will be gone by 4 a.m. And they, they've been meeting their quotas for grapes picked, I'm assuming, Mr. McFarland. Well, well, yeah, they have, and even exceeded it a few times. But why not just have them work the full eight hours of the third shift? You know, I could really use the boost in production. Uh, we, we can't do that, Mr. McFarland. Uh, we need a buffer of at least two hours between the end of your second shift and the beginning of your first shift, so that our laborers on the third don't run into any of your people. Your, your sales rep must have explained this to you. Look, I don't care if you're using undocumented workers. Does it sound like I'm from immigration? Now look, I just want to know, when are they going to start work? As I said, they will work your field from 12 a.m. until 4 a.m., and, and they'll be gone by the time your first shift shows up. I've been in this business for 20 years, and there's just no way 30 pickers could do the amount of work your laborers have been doing for just four hours. Look, why don't they use any of the field lights, huh? My foreman says that your people haven't used the lights that are set up for the second and third shifts. What's going on? Our, our laborers have extremely good uh, night vision. They work faster in the dark. Here you go. Thanks, Helen. Mr. McFarlane, I'm going through your account. No, no, so you're telling me that you have illegals with night vision who can do the work of two men. What are you talking uh, about? Yes, here it is. Uh, it's stated in your contract that you hired us to supply no less than 30 laborers to work in your field on third shift. Uh, we're doing that, I believe. It yeah. further states that you'll keep your people away from the designated field for the entire third yeah, yeah, look, shift. I'm aware of what uh, it, it says. It also I... says, Mr. McFarlane, that you will not ask the kind of questions that How the asking. hell do I know what the, my contract says? It's not even in English. <laughs> yes, I know. It's, it's a minor dialect of Hebrew. A uh, very old tradition. And the owners of the company insist on it. I'll uh, make sure you receive an English translation. But I have no doubt that your sales rep went over all these points. Yeah, he did. It made as much sense then as it does now. Look, if I don't get some straight answers, I'm going to have to cancel our contract. Oh, I don't think you'll do that, Mr. McFarland. It says here that our service is creating a substantial savings for your production. Well, yeah, yeah, it is. Look, I just like some peace of mind, Carver. I want to know who's working my field and when they'll arrive. And we're going to stay on this phone until you tell me. Uh, all right, Mr. McFarland. You strike me as a businessman. Who knows what's best for his bottom line? If I shed some light on this, you've got to promise to keep an open mind. And uh, if you repeat any of this conversation, we will not only deny it ever took place, but our legal team will take appropriate action. Come on, I'm a man of secrets myself, Mr. Carver, and I have no intention of revealing yours. Okay, then. Um, what I'm about to tell you may seem a little out there, Mr. McFarland. What do you know about graveyards? What? Uh, or more specifically, the history of human internment and cemeteries. Next to nothing. What on earth does this have to do with St all Stay this? with me. Um, thousands of years before uh, cemeteries, the dead were taken to a place where their bodies, and, and more importantly, their life essence, uh, could be reclaimed by nature. Animals did the job, mostly. What was left, the elements took care of. Yeah, fascinating stuff, Bob. Listen, when, I... when, when the first cemeteries started popping up in human societies, oh, about uh, 3000 BC, they didn't cause a problem. The bodies and life essence could still uh, be reclaimed by nature through the ground. The circle of life was not interrupted until we started using coffins. You, know, you understand the circle of life? Yes, Carver, I saw Lion King. Uh, 
Well, good. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, the human life force was being trapped inside of the coffins, and nature wasn't able to recycle it. So nature, as nature always does, solved the problem. Now, how did it do that? Well, over the next few centuries, a new a species uh, evolved, uh, one that lived underground and uh, whose sole purpose was to free the decomposing bodies from their prisons. Why? What? Nature created the gopher to solve the problem? <laughs> Nothing that benign. Uh, nature created something else, something very few humans get to see, something you uh, don't want to see. They have many names, but only one English word describes them. Mr. McFarland, have you ever heard of ghouls? For crying out loud, Carver! I've just about had enough of this crap! Who's your super buff? Come on, give, give me your Ghouls buff. are real, Mr. McFarlane. They are relatively young species evolved for a specific purpose, but, but they are very real. They consume the dead and release the essence back into the earth. Yeah, so what are you saying? You're saying that you got ghouls working in my fields? Well, since cremation, more popular, but has become more popular, there, there's been a slow decline of the cemetery business. Many ghouls have been displaced, and they need to find new ways to live. TM Labor has been proudly employing displaced ghouls for nearly four centuries. Jeez, you are so full of bull, I could use you as my fertilizer. Now look, what do these ghouls look like, huh? Uh, uh, well, ghoul relations isn't my department, but, but I have seen some sketches, and trust me, you don't really want to know. Yeah, so when are your imaginary ghouls gonna come around here? Look, it's been two minutes past midnight, and I haven't heard a single truck. But that, there won't be any trucks. G ghouls move underground, and they're very prompt. I'm, I'm sure they're in your field right now doing their job as, as promised. Yeah, well, I don't see anybody, Carver. I, I don't know how far you live from the field, but I'm sure the vantage point from your bedroom isn't good enough to see anything, especially in the dark. Vantage, vantage point, schmantage point. Look, I'm here in the field where your labors are supposed to be, and I'm all alone. Oh, Jesus. Tell me you're joking. Look, after I saw no activity out here, I got dressed, grabbed my cell phone, and came down to investigate. Oh, Christ. McFarland, oh. get out of there. Come on, what's the big deal, Carver, so I get to see your spooky workforce? Look, McFarland, I'll cancel your contract. I'll refund your money. Anything you want, just please get out of right, that all field. All right, all right, I'm getting out. What's the urgency, buddy? It's part of the deal we have with them. What's part of the deal? They can have anything they find. Snakes, squirrels, insects, whatever. Have? What do you mean, have? I mean, kill and eat. Look, if you're trying to scare me, it's not working, Carver. I don't care if you're scared or not. For God's sakes, just get out of that field. Yeah, 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 I'm going, buddy. Listen, I'm about 100 yards from the edge, but I gotta tell you, Mr. Carver, I am not happy with, with the way you've been speaking to me tonight. I'm definitely... McFarland? McFarland? McFarland, are you there? Carver, Carver, for the, for the love of God, get me out of here! I... I can't. I, I, can, I can see him. They're all around. Please, please help me, Mr. Carver! There's nothing I can do, Mr. McFarland. The, the, the rise! Oh, for the love of God! What, what's wrong with the rise? No, no! Stay away from me! Don't touch me! No, no! No! Godspeed, no, Mr. No, McFarland. No, no. Godspeed. Uh, Helen, uh, we're gonna need a cleanup crew in Napa. Yeah, I was listening. I'm on it. And I'll get some client termination forms. Thanks, Helen. Uh, and uh, another drink, please. I'll bring you the bottle. It's a money-back guarantee, all right. But you can never have your soul back. All right, we've got just one play left this evening, and we must remind you this is an entirely a night of fiction. Everything you hear is a work of imagination, and any resemblance to persons living or dead or undead will be absolutely coincidental. Dev, uh, oh dear, oh dear, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, everyone, uh, yeah, sorry that this is Fred High. I've been directing this evening, but it looks like, unfortunately, we've got breaking news that's going to interrupt us. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we were uh, kind of in the middle of a live broadcast here. Well, uh, I'm afraid we're in a bit of an emergency situation. The Center for Disease Control has issued a warning for people to stop taking the H1N1 vaccine immediately. Oh, that's the swine flu, the, right? The, the, no, no, no. You're not allowed to say that uh, the word swine flu is not patriotic. Well, you humans are all swine to me. Uh, yeah, well, the, the details are uh, scarce at the moment. Uh, reportedly, uh, some strange 
well, actually, terrible side effects of that vaccine. Like I said, the details are hard to get, but uh, uh, hold, hold on. We got something here. Uh, we got a breaking report, breaking report about what's going on here. Uh, tell us more. WMPG reporter in the field, Joe Bergeron, who is coming to us from uh, Whole Foods. Okay, let's see if we can get him on the line. Uh, Hey, uh, uh, Joe, <clears throat> Joe, Joe are, you, Joe, are you there? Uh, yeah, uh, Fred, I'm, I'm here. Okay, uh, Joe, what's the scene? Oh, well, uh, Fred, I, I'm here at the H1N1 vaccination station. They set up in tandem with the trick-or-treating spot. Uh, yeah, and yeah. It's been very yeah. convenient. The kids come in, get their candy, get a shot, but things have started getting a little weird. Oh, uh, how, how, how so? Well, I don't know exactly how to tell you this, Fred, but it's doing something uh, to the kids. Uh, doing something? Like what? Uh, well, it, what's happening? It, it doesn't mm -hmm. uh, It doesn't happen immediately, but th there are a few children who've stuck around in the store to devour mm -hmm. their Halloween candy while their parents shopped. And I, I don't know. A few minutes after they started eating candy, after getting the vaccine, uh, they uh, they fall to the ground. Uh, what? Well, they they get terribly ill. They look. I mean, God, I hate to say it, but they look dead, Fred. <laughs> Wait, you're you're telling me that the H one N one vaccine is. Killing children? Well, you see, that's where it gets strange. After they've laid down in the ground for a few minutes, they come right back up, moaning and groaning, and oh crap, here comes uh, hey, hello, now. Hey, 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 Joe, uh, Joe, you there? Uh, you're scared of a kid? Oh my God! Oh, God. Oh, God. Joe, Joe, hello, Joe, 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 Joe. It Joe. sounds like <laughs> your man on the ground will soon be in the ground. Uh, I don't know what to make of this. Uh, sorry, everyone, this kind of uh, vaccine thing isn't my thing. I guess if you need to go home or something, uh, we probably won't be finishing the show at this point. Uh, oh, oh, hold, hold on. Yeah, yeah, sorry about this. Uh, ordinarily, I ignore it, but this time I'll... Yeah, uh, hello? Yeah, hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of in the middle of this ra radio show. Yeah, uh, zombie, zombie children. Uh, yeah, okay. candy, candy, candy. Okay. Uh, I, I know. It's, yeah, it's not food. This simple sugars, but it, yeah. Uh, ooh. Oh. Uh, gee. All right. I don't uh, really know how to say this, folks, but it seems that all of the H1N1 vaccine has had some sort of terrible side effects. Uh, children all over the state are starting to turn into zombies. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, I know it, it, it's... Uh, oh, I'm beginning uh, to like uh, this one more and I, I, more. I know it, it's apparently brought on by the Halloween candy, a strong dose of high fructose corn syrup combined with the antigens in the vaccine has, at least in the young, had these disastrous side effects. But I just had my kids vaccinated last week. I, I can't give you advice in an official capacity, but I would probably go home to check on them, make sure everything's, you know, all right, you know. Yeah, I, 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 I know, hold on, there's no cause for alarm. I mean, the, wait, the, the, are, there aren't any kids in the theater tonight, are there? No. I got mine, but they only eat stevia extract and beet sugar. Yeah, and mine uh, are homeschooled. Oh, great. They, they look <laughs> fabu. They look great. Okay, um, at least we know what kind of crowd is in the uh, theater tonight. <sighs> you know what I would do if I were surrounded by a horde of screaming mutant zombie children? <sighs> What's that? Get eaten alive. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, well, okay. okay. We got another light flashing. Another reporter in the field. Uh, yeah. Let's get uh, get get her on. Okay. Who who is? Uh, Sally Rush reporting from One Longfellow Square. Uh, <clears throat> Sally. Sally. <clears throat> Uh, you, you there? Who? Oh, Sally. Fred, Fred, it's terrible. It's it's just like in the movies. Uh, yeah? uh, first it was the children. They started eating their Halloween candy. Then they they died. And then and then they came back howling and muttering. Oh, God. Oh, okay, 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 Sally, calm down, calm down. That's terrible and all, but hey, I'm live right now on the radio. I can warn people. We can get the message out. I need you to pull yourself together. What's happening? Sally, what's okay, happening? Um, okay, okay. Um, they, uh, they, <clears throat> they turned on their parents first, of course. Yeah, okay. uh, a few of them were getting looked at by paramedics, and uh, they're gone, too. <laughs> they jump onto them. They start gnawing on their flesh. Sometimes they take someone down and devour them whole. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, um, oh, that's other terrible. Other times uh, they uh, chew slowly, uh, and before they're even finished eating, the corpse comes back to life. The, the corpse comes back to what? I've not just seen a friggin' zombie movie, Fred. Well, uh, Anyone who gets bitten by a zombie becomes one themselves. Oh, 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 oh God. If I can only get to Portland Hardware, it's just, it's just a few blocks down. They were having a hell of a sale on axes, and I thought, hey, I live in Portland. What the hell do I need an axe for? But, jeez, I'm just really kind of wishing I had. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. Oh, there's one on the roof of my car. Oh, he looks pissed. Merciful Savior, please. Oh, uh, uh, Fred. Okay.
okay, okay, okay. Ch 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 chill, Sally. One. Sally, there's, no, no, there's, there's only okay. one thing I've seen. Okay, that's okay, down. yep. No, if, if you could just get one thing out to the crowd. Yeah, let them, yep. Yeah, if you just let them know. Let them know what? Them let them know, let them know. Oh, what? Let, let, let them know what, Sally? Sally, what? Sally, what? Uh. Yeah, Sally, hello? Sally? Sally? If you'd like Sally, to make a call, Sa please Sally, hang up and hello, try again. Sally, if you'd like to make Sally, a call, please Sa hang up Sally, and try again. Sally, Sally, uh, uh, all right, uh, okay. uh, uh, I'll write it up uh, this nonsense. Uh, okay. I'm a representative from the Center for Disease Control, and due to the nature of the gravity of the circumstances, I'm afraid that we're going to have to be taking over this broadcast for the remainder of the outbreak. Of course, government control. Hey, at least you didn't need a bailout. <laughs> All right, so who can you tell us? Uh, what can you tell us? Do you uh, have things under control? Yeah, the Center for Disease Control would like to state that there has been no scientific connection proven between the administration of the H1N1 vaccine and the onset of B2H402. The B B2H402? Yeah, what you pedestrian folks have been calling zombie behavior. Uh, okay, surely if you, <clears throat> uh, you, you see someone, they get the vaccine, they die... And then they become a zombie. <laughs> I mean, they, they, they show the symptoms of the B2H204. But right. they, they, isn't that kind of proof? Look, look, from a scientific standpoint, that is, and that of the public health, we're looking at these as merely two coincidental incidents. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so coincidence or not, what's the plan? Well, we will continue administering the vaccine and preventing the spread of the H1N1 epidemic while concurrently passing a motion through Congress to assign a bipartisan panel to investigate the matter thoroughly. Uh, but but what about stopping the zombies? Hey, pardon me. The the the, the ch children and I guess now their parents uh, who've got the zomb <clears throat> the B2H402 right. virus. Surely they need to be stopped before they infect the rest of the population. Look, we're recommending that people wear these small blue respirators. Uh, and how is that supposed to help? They're very comfortable. See, like, like, like they're very yeah. comfortable to wear and protects you from airborne antigens. That's great. Right but isn't it kind of late for that? I mean, the zombies oh. are already attacking people. Listen, our final piece of advice is to avoid contact with anyone with B2H402 virus. Great. We will be having said bipartisan panel administering the judgment to debate the pros and cons of instituting a quarantine, though, of course, not until Monday, because overtime hours for emergency staff were slashed during the last budget. Gotcha. Wait, wait, he, he had the vaccine? No, no, I usually only give him raw agave nectar, but we've stopped for a soda during intermission. No! no. Oh, the subject... No. Listen, hey, listen, the subject... No. The subject does appear to be manifesting no. the symptoms of the uh, B2H402. Yeah. Could you get him yeah. away from Look, me? Fred, here, take uh, a no, I don't want that stupid oh, thing. Look, look, look that's going to do me. Oh, oh God, here he goes! Get him over! 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 Get him I hate to be a poor sport, but even I'm a little grossed out by this one. Oh, God. Oh, there goes the skull. I do something. I thought that would stop it, a zombie. Isn't it funny how he slurps up the intestines just like spaghetti? Oh, God. Look at him over here at the sound effects table. Hey, sound effects, guys. There's got to be... There's gonna be something. Can you throw me something? Any anything? Guys, oh, hey, come on. Fred, take this mic stand. The, the mic stand? What the hell? Are you kidding me? How the mic stand gonna help oh, back me? Back when I was a roadie in Vegas, we fixed a bayonet to it. See? Oh! Hey, I guess that looks pretty handy. All right, all right, all right. Sure. Oh, let's go. Uh, uh, I'd hop to it. The kid looks hungry. Okay, here it goes. Oh, well, that was shocking and horrible. No, hold on, everyone. We've got everything under control. Um, everything under control. Everything. Oh God. Oh, that doesn't sound very good. Okay. Uh, just uh, if you're tuning in now, this is uh, the scene. Children who have taken the H1N1 vaccine and eaten too much Halloween candy are turning into zombies. <clears throat> We've just seen it before our own eyes here at the Talbot Lecture Hall at USM, and now they are beating their way into the room. Can someone barricade?
barricade the door, please! I'm working on it, but they're too strong. Okay, it's, okay, it's not clear how widespread this is or how fast it is happening, but we're getting reports streamed in from all over Portland that zombies are taking over the city very quickly, and the best advice that I have for you is to go... Uh, Stop being a sissy! But, uh, 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 um, and, uh, <clears throat> who might you be? Uh, Lance Corporal Higgins, you hippie freak! If you'd stop hugging trees and give it a piece of chance for ten seconds flat, we'd have a handle on the situation! I'm sorry, it's just a little, uh, overwhelming. You know, we were just trying to run this little radio show and... Phooey! Uh, radio? The only thing radio is good for is order an airstrike, and hell, I'm gonna do that right now! Central Command! Central Command! Are you tuned into this frequency? If so, blow Congress Street back to the 1900s! Don't you guys have a proper channel for that? Proper channels are down, kid! This is the only live channel left, and I'm sure as hell not letting you keep ranting your nonsensical wishy-washy indie music on it! This is war, kid! Plain and simple. Us versus terror. We are pretty sure this is the outcome of an Al-Qaeda plot. What? You think this is a chance that the H1N1 vaccine was infected with zombies, Jeremy? You, you think, what, that some government plot or maybe the results of no one testing the crap? The thought did occur to me. The terrorists, plain and simple, terrorists. And we're gonna blow them to kingdom come. Hey, how's my airstrike coming? Hey, who exactly do you think is listening? What the uh, hell is that? That, that? that would be the zombies, I think. We were just discussing it uh, before you stomped up here. I think they're trying to get into the auditorium. Well, holy hell, kid, we need to stop them. This is the shelter of last resort. I had 10,000 people being airlifted to this location. Oh, well, be my guest then. Oh, uh, here they come, here they come. Holy oh, hell, uh, they're coming in and they're coming on strong. Oh, God, That's stop time to act like a man to blow child. Stop for the love of God, stop them, all right, oh, here man, we go. Great time for the mayor's support. Come on, civil command, come on. Oh, there's too many of them. I'm running out of sound effects props to throw at them. We're gonna have to act like we're on this one alone. All right, Pico, grab that bayonet and let's charge it. John, I'm gonna charge it with what? Whoa, we've gotta push it back through the door. Then we can barricade it again. What, you, 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 no, I, go, I guess go, it's okay, go, okay, go, here we go. go. Wasn't that a sight for sore eyes? Uh, sore from getting the business end of a bayonet. Uh, where were you during all of that? Hiding. You know, my contract doesn't cover melees with the living dead. You know what it takes to ensure a sexy bond like mine. Oh, wonderful. Um, so what about the, the corporal? Cor corporal? Uh, uh, corporal? Cor oh. Uh, hi, I was just... Uh, Hi, Corporal, you're, you know, you're not looking... Brad. You're not, uh, hi. Brad. You're not looking so good there. Brad. Not that it looks like you got a little bit of a bite taken Brad. out of your abdomen, and it was not, just could it not stop so close to me. If you did, uh, help! Help, a gigantic drooling zombie corporal is after me! Oh, this God. is precisely the kind of incident my contract does not cover. Don't you, the sound effects guys, don't you have something else you can give me? Sorry, all out. They have all kinds of guns in Vegas. Not so easy in Maine. That's great, great. Okay, uh, we still got the, uh, the slide whistle, right? Okay, okay. It, it's it's not much, but maybe you can now I can just uh, j jab him just a little bit. It, uh, oh, get off me! Get off me! Get off! Oh, get, get away! Get away! Hey! 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 hey. Uh, would you stop? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, oh! What, 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 what exactly? What was that? Ten forty, Bravo Squad, subject down. The fox is out of the hen house. Uh, <coughs> uh, hello. Uh, who, who, who is uh, that? Codename Snakeskin, sir. I'm from the Navy SEALs. Oh, the SEALs. Thank God. You, you mean you... Yeah, we heard your live broadcast over the radio and came as quickly as we could. It took a while to secure the location. Apparently the zombies were quite interested in the vending machine. You mean it's over? Yeah, there's a lot of zombie guts to deal with, but yeah, it's over. 
Oh, all right. And uh, what, what happens next? Finish up your radio show and get out of here. We'll have a cleanup crew over here in a moment. They're currently trying to talk down a group of soldiers of Fortune fans are shacked up in the Home Depot. <laughs> sure. We'll do that. Yeah, one last thing. Yeah. Past where it is, Turkey has flown the coop. Turkey has flown No, 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 don't say it unless there's an emergency. Over and out. Jack in the box, poison viper, the petunias flock through the meadow. Well, I suppose this would be the point where my contract takes over again. Though after that encounter, I think I'm in the mood for retirement. In tonight's broadcast, you heard the tales, The Ghost Behind the Back Door by Roger Gregg. Losing He Was Hell by Fred Greenhalge, Bone Lake by Mark Laflamme, Third Shift by Kevin Anderson, and H1 Insane by Fred Greenhalge, directed and produced by Fred Greenhalge. Starring in tonight's tales were Tom Power, Christine Marshall, Bert Brimmer, Philip Hobby, Janice Gardner, and on behalf of WMPG, Dale Robin Lockman. Live sound effects by Paul Drynan, Michael Gruber Manning, computer effects by Michael Townsend, live music by Barb Truex, mixing by Dave Bunker, production assistance by Diane Ballin. This was all brought to you by the power of community radio, WMPG. Special thanks to Roger Gregg, Tony Palermo, and the University of Southern Maine. This broadcast will be made available for download in mere hours at www.radiodramarevival.com and www.finalrune.com and will also be archived on www.mpg.org. To learn more about Final Rune Productions and their many stories of the year, terrifying, thoughtful, fantastic, and just plain strange, visit their website www.finalrune.com finalrune.com representing the GAA the Ghouls Alliance of America I am the Ghoul Keeper John Hickson All right, well, we just about got the uh, zombie guts cleared out of here at uh, Talbot Lecture Hall. It looks like we've got um, some mopping up to do. Their brains splattered from one end of the auditorium to the other. But um, before we get to all that, we would like to urge you yet again to uh, support WMPG in the Power Up campaign. This was available through lots of technology this evening. Of course, the best technology was to be here in the Talbot Lecture Hall at USM, but if not, you may have heard this on the radio or at finalrune.com or radiodramarevival.com or most importantly, wmpg.org, which you uh, can stream online and pretty soon, with the uh, if you help support the Power Up campaign, we'll be able to hear from Lewiston to Wells. So uh, check out wmpg.org for more information on that and have a very happy and safe Halloween. <laughs>